All right, good morning, class. We are going to be looking at project management today. So we're on to our next topic. Project management. So we will begin with a definition for a project. A project is uh, regarded as a unique undertaking that has a specified time um, as a specified time that's the word I'm looking for a specified time as a specified time meaning we expect it to end to end within a given time it also has resources that are assigned to it specified resources and at the end of the specified completion time then the project is disbanded and the resources are reassigned to other areas so then as i often say to students that your time at the university is a project because it's a unique undertaking it has a specified time and when you're through all the resources that you would normally use to attend school, the money is the clothes, the time, the effort, you use that to do something else. All right. Now, when we when we undertake a project, we cannot achieve the project as a whole immediately. For example, we want to build a house. We can't just get up and say house, here you are. What we need to do is to break down the achievement of the building of the house into the requisite parts. And those parts would be the smallest attainable parts that make the project achievable. And not only do we break it down into the smallest achievable part that makes it achievable, but we also um, organize those parts into a logical sequence. Um, the logical sequence we call the, the predecessor relationship. And not only do we accord a predecessor relationship, to the parts, but we also accord a time. Now, how we accord the time depends on how familiar we are with the project that we're doing. Even though I say familiar, we keep in mind that no two projects are exactly alike. So a project is still a unique undertaking. So if we give just one time element to each of the activity, we're usually utilizing what we call the critical path method, the CPM. But if you see, we give us, we give more than one time, three times in particular to each activity that we tend to be utilizing what we call the PERT, the Project Evaluation Review Technique Method. Now we're gonna begin by looking at the critical path method where we assign just one time element to each. Um, activity. Now at this stage we are not particularly interested in exactly what the activities are. What we're more interested in is just the breakdown of the project into different activities. So we normally just call those activities A, B, C, D, etc. We're not necessarily interested in what is A and what is B. At this stage that's not important. Now the table that we normally present with the breakdown of the project into smaller activities along with the relationship between the activities otherwise called the immediate predecessor relationships along with the time that table really is called a work breakdown structure because we're broken down the project big project into smaller structures into smaller pieces that we can accomplish now, so a work breakdown structure may look like this. So I'm going to put on the board the work breakdown structure um, of a project. Exactly what it is, we're not interested to know at this point. We just want the, to do the basic principle. So our first example is going to be consider the following project.
So the activity stretches from A to I. All right, so what the second column in predecessor means immediate predecessor is saying that activities A, B, and C, notice there's a dash there, doesn't require any immediate predecessor. It means that they can be done at the beginning of the project and they can run parallel because they're usually maybe startup activities. So they can be done one beside the other. Nothing needs to be done for those activities to be done. So any such activity usually comes from the start node of the project or network. Now D requires B to be done before it can be accomplished. C requires E to be done before it can be accomplished or sorry E requires C to be done before it can be accomplished. F requires A and B to be done before F can be accomplished. G requires D and E to be done before G can be accomplished. H requires C to be done before H can be accomplished. And finally, when you have done F and G, then you can do I. And having done I, then the project is regarded as being completed. And then the times are given in weeks. Um, at a time. So A, 12 weeks, B, 11 weeks, etc. So the last one is seven, right? So after 31, you have seven. Now, one of the tools of project management is network analysis, where we take this work breakdown structure and we convert it to a network. the network is a pictorial of the work breakdown structure, but we don't convert it to a pictorial just for pictorial sake. We convert it to a pictorial, aka the network, because of the information that is presented in the network or that we can deduce or determine in the network that will help the project manager to manage the project. In particular, we're interested in the network that will provide certain information to the manager that will help the project manager to affect the management of the project. Now, the network is a series of nodes and arrows. So the nodes can be, the nodes can be squares, the nodes can be rectangulars, the nodes can even be a plus sign. Well, the node that I'm going to use is a circle. Now, so these are called nodes. And so along with the nodes, we use arrows, right? So all of these are called nodes of one way or the other, and then we use arrows. Now with the arrows, we can use a methodology called activity on arrow or activity on node. We will be using the activity on node methodology to draw 
with the nodes and the arrows. Now, a node, whether it be a rectangle, a triangle, the plus sign or a circle, must contain the following information. And when you're going to put the information in or determine the information in the node, you cannot just write them helter skelter. You must write them in a particular order. They are read in that order, right? So in the circular node, you have at the top the activity name. So AN means the activity name. And in the bottom center, you have the activity time, AT the activity time. Now the other pieces or the other pieces divided into four quadrants or quarters. In the top left hand corner, you have what is called the early start time of the activity. And the equivalent to the early start time is the early finish time is in the right in the right top side. So early finish time. All right, so EFT is early finish time. In the bottom left, you have the late start time. And the corresponding bottom right is the late finish time. Now, outside on the node, you have a calculated figure that is called the slack time, all right? So the slack time will be the difference between the late finish and the early finish or the late start and the early start, one or the other, but you should get the same. So if your friend uses late finish minus the early finish, and you use late start minus early start, you must get the same figure. If you're getting different figures, then somebody in network has a, an error in it, right? So we use these or this node, whichever of the node you choose to use, and you use a circle because it lends itself better to freehand drawing for myself. Some places you will see a rectangle, some places you will see a square, some places you will, you will see a T. What you won't see though is a triangle, right? You'll see some kind of quadrilateral or circular um, shape. All right, so then we're gonna take this work breakdown structure that we have here and we're gonna draw the network, right? So the project management, what we're looking at in particular is the network and we want the information from the network that will help us to manage the project. All right, so keep this table in your mind or take a picture of it and use it. So we're gonna be drawing the network based on this work breakdown structure. All right, so, here we go. Now the network has a beginning. And we call that beginning the start node. So ST simply means start. The start node is similar to what I will call the starting line of a race. You cannot begin the race without having a defined starting time, a starting place. You have a defined starting place and you have a defined ending place. And the race is run in between the defined start and the defined end. So when you draw a network for me, you must have the start node because that is where all activities will emanate from in terms of where you will organize yourselves to begin to accomplish or to achieve a project. Now, so the start node, just like a race, time at the start node is always zero, right? Just like when you're running a race and the starter succumbs to, to the starter's block, he has his starters gone and he has his timepiece. The timepiece 
has a zero time and there it is zeroed out because that's where you're going to begin to count your time from. So following the information in the work breakdown structure, we see that activities A, B, and C have a dash across from them under the immediate predecessor column. What that means is that those activities do not require or need anything, any activity to be accomplished for them to be begun. It means then that they can go on in a parallel fashion. You can start them at the starter's block, right? So you will look at them as um, they are the ones you start the relay, start at the beginning, right? So any activities that do not have an immediate predecessor will always come from the starter's block, okay? So activities A will come from the starter's block. So here's activity A coming out of the starter's block and the time is 12 weeks. Here's activity B. It's time it's 11 weeks. And here's activity C. And it has eight weeks. Now for activity D to be accomplished, needs B to have been done. So here's activity. D as in dog coming out of B and that time is 13 weeks. Now notice that my arrow has on an arrow head, right? Activity E comes out of C. And activity E in six weeks. And then we have activity F coming out of A and B. So you just draw one arrow from B, another arrow from A, they terminate at the same point. And then you draw your node to indicate that activity F required those and it takes 18 weeks. Activity G requires D and E. Again, okay. one line coming out of D, one line coming out of E, and that's activity G, and it requires a time of 11 weeks. And you have activity H coming out of C. The time for each is 31 weeks. Then you have activity I coming out of F and G. It requires seven weeks. Then activity I being the last activity you have your finish node. So you have a line going from I to finish, but notice that H doesn't terminate anywhere, it's just in there flapping in the wind. So you draw a line from H, usually a broken line to finish, all right? Good. So any activity that does not terminate in another node, you draw that, draw an arrow from that activity to the finish node. All right, 
So we have drawn the network. So what is on this page is our network, right? Our project network. So if you're asked to draw the project network, this is what we expect you to draw, the project network. Good. Now, as I said, we draw the project network to get information from the project network. To get the information from the project network, we make two passes through the network. The first is what we call the forward pass. So we're going to make what is called a forward pass through the network. On the forward pass of the network, we're going to be able to calculate the early start time, the early finish time, and the completion time of the project, All right? So on the forward start, we're able to calculate, on the forward pass, we're able to calculate the early start, the early finish, and the project completion time. So now to begin your forward pass, you go to the start node. Notice that the time in the start node is zero. Therefore, any activity that is coming from the start node, the early start time will always be zero. Any activity that's coming from the start node, the early start time will be zero. Now, the early finish time of activity A is the early start time plus the duration. The duration is 12, so it's zero plus 12. For B, it's zero plus 11, and for C, zero plus eight. Now, the early start time of activity E will be the eight, coming from activity C, where the eight represents the early finish time of activity C. So the early start time of activity E will be the early finish time of activity C, its immediate predecessor. For activity D, the early start time will be 11, where 11 is the early finish time for activity B and therefore forms the early start time for activity D, dog. Now 13 plus 11, that's the early start plus the duration will give us 24. So the early finish time for activity D is 24. When you look at activity F, activity F has two immediate predecessors in the form of A and in the form of B. The early finish time for A is 12. The early finish time for B is 11. So even though B is finished at week 11, activity F cannot be begun because activity A is still going on at week 11 up to week 12. Therefore, activity F cannot be begun until the activity A is completed at week 12. So activity F will therefore be begun at week 12. Therefore, we define the early start of any activity as the maximum early finish of its immediate predecessors. So here the early finish of F's immediate predecessors were 11 for B and 12 for A. So the maximum between 11 and 12 is 12. So the early finish for um, F is at week 30. Good. Likewise, we go to G. We let's finish the early finish for E. It's week 14. So when you go to G, you have coming from E an early finish time of 14, but coming from D is an early finish time of 24. So G needs both of these activities to be completed before it can be begun. So again, 
Though activity E is finished at week 14, G cannot be begun because D is still going on at week 14, way up to week 24. So the earliest time that activity G can be begun is in week 24 when G is completed. And therefore, the early start of G is the maximum of the early finish of its immediate predecessors. So 24 plus the duration of 11 takes activity G up to week 35. For activity H, its early finish time will be eight. Early start time will be eight. because the early finish time of its immediate predecessor will be eight. And 31 plus eight is 39. So going to the finish line, we're not quite at the finish line yet. You have 39 going from H, but I has not yet been calculated. So going into I, you have 35 from G and you have 30 from F. Therefore, the early finish time of G will form the early start time of I because it's the maximum between 30 and 35. So 35 plus 7 is 42. So when you go to the finish line, you have 42 coming into the finish from I and you have 39 coming from H. So again, the maximum of the two will be will form the early finish. So the early finish time for the project is week 42. So we have the project manager can determine what is the earliest time you can begin an activity, what is the latest time you can finish that activity. Now we know, though we plan to be early, we don't always get to begin things early, but we, even though we don't get to begin early, we still want to be in a position that whatever the time we begin, whatever later time we begin, we will still meet the deadline. Now the deadline here is week 42. So the manager, the project manager is also interested in knowing if circumstances were to be so, what is the latest time we can begin and end an activity and still meet the deadline of 42 weeks. So in order to do that, we're gonna have to do a backward pass. Through the network, All right? Now, on the backward pass, we begin the backward pass by taking the information or the number that is in the finish node and we walk back ways on all of the arrows that came into the finish line to terminate where they came from. So we will take the 42 and we will backtrack on the solid arrow first. And we will take the 42 and we will deposit it in the empty slot that meets us, which will be the late finish slot. So let me late start, late finish. So the late finish for I would be 42 and the late finish for H will also be 42 because we're taking what is in the finish node and we're making those to be the late finish for those items that terminated into the finish node. That's how we begin the backward pass loop, right? So having begun that, now we do a series of backward moves to get to, to the start node, right? So in the start node, you have your early start to be zero, your early finish is zero, and your time slot is zero. Right, I mean, your time duration is zero. No, so then to find the late start for activity I, we take the blue 42 and we subtract the duration of seven. 
So that will give us 30, 42 minus 7. That will give us 35. Dude, we take the blue 42 in age and we minus the 31. And that will give us what then? 42 minus 31. And that will give us 11, right? No, so we're going backwards. Now we go to I and we see there are two arrows that came into I. One came from F, one came from G. So the blue 35, we take and we walk backwards twice. Once to F, once to G. So we take up 35 and we walk to F. And where that empty spot, which is the late finish, is for F, we deposit that 35. And where that empty spot is for G in the bottom right, which is the late finish, we deposit that 35 also. Good. So now that we have found the late finish for F and for G, we calculate the late start. So for F, it is 35 minus 18, and that gives us 17. And for G, it is 35 minus 11, that gives us the blue 24, good. Now, from G, we go to E and D. Why are we going to E and D? Because a line came in from D and a line came in from E into G, so you're going backwards. So you take the blue 24 and you walk backwards and where we see the late finish slot for E, we place that 24. And where we see the late finish slot for D, we place that 24. So now that we know the late finish for D and for E, we can calculate the late start. So 24 minus six, which is 18. 24, that's the blue 24 minus 13. That is 11, that's the D, right? Good. Now, let's go back to E. There are two lines that came out of um, C, rather. There are two lines that came out of C. One line went to E, one line went to H. So in going back ways, two lines will be coming into C one from H and one for E. The one from H will be carrying 11, the late finish, the late start for H, sorry, and the one for E will be carrying the 18, the late start for E. So on the back, so on the backward pass, when you come to a situation where you have a competition between the late starts that you will use to form the late finish of the immediate following predecessor. The smaller one gets to be the late start, the late finish, sorry. So here between 18 and 11, 11 gets to be the late finish. Good. So on to, And to B, going into B, you will have a line coming from D as in dog and one from F as in finger. So you'll have 17 coming in from F and you will have 11 coming in from D. Again, as I said, there's a competition on the backward pass. The smaller one is the one that you take for the late finish. For A, only one arrow came out of A to F, so only one arrow will be considered on the backward pass to go back, and that is from F to A, so that would be 17. So we have determined the late finish for A, B, and C. We can now determine the late start. So for C, it's 11 minus 8, and that would be 3. 
for B, it would be 11 minus 11. That's the blue 11 minus the black 11. That would be zero. And for A, it would be 17 minus 12. That is five. Good. So going back to the start node, you have five coming from A. You have zero coming from B. And you have three coming from C. There's a competition for the late finish slot. So I said the smallest or the smaller gets the slot on the backward. So it means their year late finish would be zero. And the zero at the bottom minus the zero for the duration gives you zero for the late start. So you find that in the start node, your time elements will consist of zeros. Okay. All right, so now that we have completed the forward pass and the backward pass, we now are able to calculate what is called the slack values of each activity. The slack value is simply the time for which you can delay an activity before you begin it. So the slack value is the time for which you can delay an activity before beginning that activity. If the activity has zero slack, it means that it cannot be delayed and it's called a critical activity. If you have more than zero for the slack, then it's called a non-critical activity and you can delay that activity up to that time of the slack. All right, now the slack time, to find the slack time, it is either the late finish minus the early finish or the late start minus the early start. So it's one or the other. Both of them must give you the same information. So if your friend is using one and you're using the other, you should get the same information, it's same value in terms of the slack. If you get different information, somebody's network has an error in it, all right? So the slack now, we're gonna calculate the slack. For each for A, it is five. 17 minus 12 or five minus zero. Either way you get five. For B, it's 11, that's the blue 11 minus the red 11. For the blue zero minus the red zero. Either way it's zero. For C, either way it's three. For D, either way it's zero. For E, it's 10. 24 minus 14 or 18 minus eight. And for um, F it is five, 35 minus 30 or 17 minus 12. For G, that's zero. For H, it's 42 minus 39 or 11 minus eight, either way that's three. And for I, it is zero. The blue 42 minus the red 42 or the blue 35 minus the red 35. Good. So now we're able to determine, aside from the early start and the early finish, the late start and the late finish for each activity, we now know the slack time for each activity. Now that we know the slack time for each activity, so you find that for the start node, zero minus zero, that's also a, a critical activity. So any activity that has zero slack is called a critical activity, right? So I'm gonna turn the page and I'm gonna write down the critical activities. So the critical activities are the start node, sorry, not A, B, D, G, and I. The start node, no, a logical, listing 
of the critical activities with a dash in between indicates that you have written the critical path. So the critical activities are written with a comma between them, but the critical path is written as follows. The start to B to D to G to I to finish. So the critical activities, commas in between, the critical path, it's a pathway from the start of the project through specific activities that are determined to be critical to the finish line. So the critical pathway is defined as the longest time path through the project, but that longest time path is also the shortest time within which the project could be accomplished. Think about it, it sounds a little bit strange, but that's what it is. So the critical path is the longest time path through the project, but at the same time, that longest time path through the project is the shortest time within which the project could have been accomplished. All right, now, a network may have multiple critical activities, but it does not mean that they all fall on the same critical pathway, which means that a project may have more than one critical pathway. So if you're asked to list the critical activities, you list them with commas between them. But if you're asked to list critical pathways, you have to look to see if all those activities fall on the same pathway or they branch into different pathways. If they branch into different pathways, then you must list each different pathway that they branch into as a response to list the critical path, All right? Now, as I said to you earlier, that how we list the times is dependent on if we're looking at time as deterministic, that is, we're familiar with the activities that consist of the project or make up the project in to a fair um, degree where we can say um, experience has shown that uh, this activity will take on an average this particular time. So we're fairly confident that the activity will take such and such a time. However, there are instances where we're not sure either the project is fairly new or for whatever reason, you're not confident about the time. Now, if you're not confident about the time, then we resort to a probabilistic determination of the time or statement of the time. That will tell us that we're in the PERT statement of the time for each activity. And so you find that the work breakdown structure when it comes to the time, it will look a little different. So I'm going to put another problem on the board. So you consider the following project where the activities are now all in days, right? It doesn't have to be in days, it could be in any other time. So another example. So it's example two. So consider the following. project, all activities are in days, right? In the first one, it was weeks, so the project took 42 weeks. So you have the activity, and you have the immediate predecessor, I'm not good at spelling. No, for this 
the swap rate on structure, you find that you're going to have three different times for each activity. You have the optimistic time. We call that A. We have the normal time or average time. We call that M or the most likely time. So average, normal, most likely, that's M. Then we have the pessimistic time. And we call that B, all right? So I'm going to list the activities from A to H. Again, I'm going to list on the immediate predecessor A, B, and C. Then you have A. Now for each activity, you will have three times listed under the optimistic, A under the pessimistic, four under the under the average time, sorry, under the pessimistic six. Again, two under the optimistic, three under the average or the most likely, and four under the pessimistic. And likewise, I list for each of the activity going down. I'm sorry, my numbers are a little bit wonky, but I think you can follow the line now. So the question then is, so miss, so what do I do if each activity now has three different times? Well, you calculate what is called the expected time, right? You calculate the expected time. And the expected time, uses the following formula. A plus 4M plus B all over six. So let us do, um, say one of the times, right? I'm gonna do for C. I'm gonna do for C, then I'm just gonna write in the others, right? So for C, so the expected time for C, you're going to have three plus four times four plus 11 over six. So that's four, four, 16 and three, 19. 19 and 11 is 30. So you have 30 divided by six. So the expected time for C is 30 divided by six equals five, All right? So I'm going to just simply write in the calculated expected times for each of the activities on the next page. So you know how to calculate um, the expected time for each activity. So I'm gonna reproduce a table over the next page with not all of these times, but with the calculated expected time using that formula. So I did one C, all right, to give you the idea. So the table now will look like this, A, B, C, D, to H. So you have your activity.
which you have your activity name. You have your immediate predecessor. And you have your expected time. You have A to H. Predecessors, again, your dashes. You have your A, you have your BD, AC, your A, and you have your FD. So the expected times that which will be calculated would be four. And you remember these are days four, three, five, three, five, three, three, four. And these are the times that you would use on your um on your network. So what do you do? After you've done this, you draw your network as usual. So we're gonna draw the network on the next page, all right? So we know that our, our network, you start with your start, S means start, you know it's a zero time there. Then you have A, B, and C coming out. A. So the time that you will put on there is four. You have your B. So it's your calculated time, which is three have the C and your calculated time on the C that is five. All right, you know that D requires A. And um, E requires B and D. F requires A and C. We generally try not to cross the lines. Sometimes you can't um, help it. So you have F requires A and C. I mean, if you fiddle with it, you could probably find a way not to cross it. G requires A. And H requires F and G. Now, being the last element, you have your finish. Now, if you notice E, He's slapping in the wind, he's not going anywhere. So you take your pencil and you bring that to the finish line, All right? Now, so the times that we put in 
are the times that we calculated. So let me use a different color ink so, um, so that we can see them clearly. All uh, right, so I can use the green. All right, so for the A, it would be four days. For B, it will be three days. For C, it will be five days. For D, it will be three days. For E, it would be five days. For F, it would be three days. For G, it will be three days. And for H, it will be four days, right? So those times are times that we calculated. Okay, we did not use all three. We calculated the expected time and we're using them. So we're gonna do our forward pass through the network again, all right? So we know that the start node, the early start time would be zero, the early finish time would be zero. We know that all nodes that come out of the start node, the early start would be zero. The early finish would be the early start plus the duration. So zero plus four, four, zero plus three, three, zero plus five, five, right? We, let, we go to activity G. Why do I G first? Because only one arrow goes into it. So four coming from A, four plus three, seven. Now, if you look at D, then it's also one. So it would be the four going into it, four plus three is seven. If you look at E, however, you have three coming from B and seven coming from D. So the earliest would be seven. 7 and 5, 12, right? And if you look at F, you have 4 coming from A and 5 coming from C. So it would be 5, 5 and 3, 8, right? If you look at H now, you have 7 coming from G and you have 8 coming from F. So it would be 8, 8 plus 4, 12. So if you look at the finish line, you have 12 coming in from E and you have 12 coming in from H. So either way, the earliest finish time will be 12, all right? So you do a backward pass now through the network to find the late starts. So again, remember you pick up what is in the finish and you take it backwards on any arrows that came into the finish node. So you're going to go backwards on the blue dash line to E and on the solid line to H with the 12 that is in the finish node. So the 12 there and the 12 there. So you have opened up the loop to begin the backward pass, right? So from H, you go to F with that 12. So 12 minus 3 is 9. From H, you go to G and you will take eight because 12 minus four is eight. So you take that eight, right? Now, when you come to, to um, E, 12 minus five is seven, good? So you go to D with that seven. Seven minus three is four. You come to B with your seven. Good. Seven minus three is four. You come to C with your nine. Nine from five from nine, leave four. All right, so eight from three, well, sorry, eight minus three is five. Let me make sure I've not made any errors here. So 12 minus four is eight. Eight 
yes, I see my error here. So here for F, would, you know, sometimes some things just look a little bit off to you. So let me correct that. Let me correct that, let me correct that, All right? So I'm correcting something here. So from H to F, you take eight, not 12. So that would be eight. So eight minus three is five, right? And you take the five to C, five from F to C, so that's five, five minus five is zero. So let me go to E, 12 minus five is seven. So that seven is correct. So I go now to eight minus three, it's five. So you take that five there. So from E, I take seven to D, seven minus three is four. So coming back to A now, you have five coming from F. You have four coming from D and you have five coming from G. So that would be four. So four minus four is zero, all right? So you have coming into the finish node, you have zero, that's a blue zero. You have four and you have zero. So it's zero and zero minus zero is zero, all right? Okay, so please note the corrections. All right, so now we calculate our slack time. So the slack time for A, that would be zero because four minus four or zero minus zero. For B, it's seven minus three or four minus zero. So either way it's four. For C is the blue five minus the red five or the blue zero minus the red zero. So that's zero. For D, it's the blue seven minus the red seven or the blue four minus the red four. So that's zero. And so calculating for the others, it's one, zero, zero, zero. So the critical activities here, So the critical activities are start, you have A, you have C, you have D, you have E, you have F, and you have H. Critical activities are so the critical parts. Critical parts are when you look at start, picking up the zero track from A, you go to A, the next one from A, if you follow logically from A, is D. Then when you go from D, you go to E. When you go from E, you go to the finish. So that's one critical path. The next one, you go back to the start where the zero is. You follow the next trajectory of zeros. Then you go to C. And from C, you go to F. And from F, you go to H. And from H, you go to finish. And I just saw another critical path. 
Start, you go back to A. From A, you go straight to F. And from F, you go to H. And from H, you go to finish. So there are actually three critical pathways in this. So again, look from A, from start, you go to A. From A, you go to D. From D, you go to E. From E, you go to finish. That's one. Go back to start, so go to A. From A, you branch down to F. From F up to H, from H to finish. You go back to start, you look at the next zero, which is C. From C, you go to F, and from F, you go to H, and from H, you go to finish. So this is what I said to you, what I meant when I said to you, the critical activities will not necessarily fall on the same critical pathway. So the critical activities here are A, C, D, E, F, and H. But the critical pathways are actually three different pathways. But they're made up of the critical activities. They just branch into different pathways, different walkways. Again, you begin at the very start node. From start, you follow the zeros in a logical manner. So from start, you go to A. A has two branches, which means that two branches of zeros coming out of it, which means that that's an alert to you that there are multiple pathways going on there. So from A, you notice that one zero is at D, but one zero is at F. Those two nodes are coming out of A. That's an alert that there are different pathways. So you follow them one by one. So from A to D to E to finish. From start to A, F to H to finish. You go back, you realize there are another set of zeros which you didn't pick up in that set of pathways. So you trace it again from start to C to F to H to finish. So this project has three critical pathways. Right? The critical activities are A, C, D, E, F, and H. Now, which activities can be delayed? And what is the longest you can delay? Notice the superlative word, longest. Which activities can be delayed? You have activities B and your activities G. So those are the activities that can be delayed. Now, which activity can be delayed the longest and for how long? Activity B can be delayed the longest and that is for four days. All right, good. So notice the use of the English. Which activities can be delayed? Well, activities B and G have non-zero slacks. Therefore, activities B and G can be delayed. Which activity can be delayed the longest? That's activity B, for how long? For four days, all right? Now, when you have a work breakdown structure that carries probabilistic times, such as this, right? Meaning that each activity can be delayed can be can have multiple um, um, times, activity times. Oftentimes we ask you for another bit of information, which is the probability of the project being completed in a certain time. Give me one second, please, Claire.
Now, because there are multiple pathways, I'm going to ask you about one specific pathway, right? So when you have a work breakdown structure, let me say this again. So when you have a work breakdown structure where the, each activity carries multiple times, then that's a heads up that one of the questions that you will be asked or you're most likely to be asked about that, that work breakdown structure after you, have done, after you have done the network is a probability question, all right? So I'm going to pick one of the pathways to ask you about. So I'm gonna ask you um, about pathway A, D, and E, all right? So I'm going to ask a question. So I'm just picking one of the pathways to ask you about. If this were only one pathway, then the question will be pitched to that one pathway. This has multiple pathways. So I'm pitching the question to just one of the pathways. So I'm going to turn the page. So I'm going to ask you another question. So the question will look like this. I'm just picking one of the pathways. So I said, what is the probability that pathway A, D, and E can be completed within 14 days? So you're gonna find that we're gonna appeal to your normal distribution um, knowledge. So the expected completion time is 12 days on that pathway, right? So the question is really asking you, what is the probability that the project can be completed over this time within 14 days, right? Now, when you begin to talk about expected time and normal distribution, you know that you're going to have to be calculating what we call the Z value, right? So the Z value is found by taking the mean time sorry, the expected time, the expected completion time, which is 12 minus the mean time, it's not 12, 14. There. Let me say that again. The Z value is found by taking the requested completion time or the ask about quest completion time, which is 14 in this instance, right? So you take the ask about, completion time, which is 14, you minus the expected completion time, which is a calculated time from the network, which is 12. And you divide it by the standard deviation of the project, right? So the Z value in symbolic form is usually the Ask about time minus the calculated time from the network divided by the standard deviation of the project, right? Good. So mu is used to represent the ask about time. And bar X, which is the mean time, is the calculated time that you would have determined from the network. And sigma p is the standard deviation of the project. Now you will always know the ask about time because the question asks you to ask you about 14 days. And the 
mean time, you will know that because you will have calculated that on the network. The standard deviation, however, of the project is something you will have to calculate. Now, though it says the standard deviation of the project, you do not need to find every item in the project. What we normally do is to find the standard deviation for the pathway activities because those normally are a good proxy for the standard deviation of the project. So the question is, how do I find the standard deviation of the project? Well, as I said, we only usually use, or it's easier to use, just the activities on the pathway that you're being asked for, because that is usually a critical pathway and that controls how well you achieve the project. So it's a good proxy and that saves you time and effort. So to find the standard deviation of a project, we need to find the variance of the project. All right, so I'm gonna turn another page. So to find the standard deviation of the project, we need the variance of the project, All right? Now, the variance of the project is found by finding the variance of each activity, ACTF, on the critical path and summing, then taking the square root. Good. So the variance of the project is found by finding the variance of each activity on the critical path, and you sum those up, then you take the square root. So the question then is, how do I find the variance of each activity? And so to find the variance of each activity, we take the formula, B minus A upon six all square for each activity, right? So the activities that we're dealing with are activities A, D, and E, right? So the activities that we're dealing with are activities A, D, and E. So it means we must look at activity A, D, and E we must find the pessimistic time for A, and we must find the pessimistic, the optimistic time for A. We must subtract the two, we must divide by six, and we must square that, right? So remember what we're doing? We're finding the variance for each of the activity on the pathway that we're asked about. So the variance of each activity on the critical path we find that variance first, and then we sum them, and we take the square root of that sum. But the question is, how do I find the variance of each activity? It is the pessimistic time of that activity minus the optimistic time of that activity divided by six, all square. So we do that for each activity on the critical path. Then we sum them. Then we take the square root. So I'm going to go to another page. So it's A, D, and E, right? So for A, D, and E, we look for the pessimistic time. So the pessimistic time for A was six. The optimistic time was two, six over six, six minus two over six square. We'll work it out in a minute, but let's just write down for D. It is nine for the pessimistic minus one for the optimistic. Over six squared. And for E, it is seven for the pessimistic, pessimistic 
minus the optimistic, which is three over six, and you square that. So we can work that out now. So it is for the for A, it is six minus two, which is four. So four divided by six, it's 0 0.66, whatever. So I'm going to find the square root of that. So it's, let me do that again. Four minus, sorry, six minus two is four. Four divided by six equals 0 0.6666 into into perpetuity. And I take the square root of that. That gives me to two decimal places, 0 0.44, right? So I, re, I do my um, shortening at the end after I finish work it out so that I don't take up um, rounding error. So for the next one for D, it's nine minus one, that's equal to eight, eight divided by six, that's equal 1.333, all right, take the square root of that. And get 1.777, again, 1.78 two decimal places, all right? And then for the next one, it's seven minus three equals four divided by six equal 0.6 is whatever. I take the square root of that and I get 0 0.44 again. Right, zero point four four. So I found the variance for each of the activity on the critical path that you're as uh, remember know what I said, you sum up these. So you add your point four four plus your one point seven eight plus your point four four, and that equals two point six six so the variance for the project is two point six six so variance and that is known as sigma square p right is two point six six so the standard deviation which is what we're after so the standard deviation so therefore, it's T A N D A R D standard deviation, which is known as sigma p, is equal to the square root of two point six six. So you now take the square root of two point six six. So tap into your calculator, the square root sign two point six six, and that equals to one point six three. So that's a little animal here after 1.63. Good. So you go back now to where you had your formula written down. I'm trying to find my page. Not there. Is the page missing? Let's see one of my page. No, I'm trying to find the page. Page that I wrote the. Okay, I'm not finding it. All right, so I'll just open a new page. All right, so we know that our our standard deviation is one point six three. So remember, we had said that the z value is equal to mu minus bar x over sigma p. And we said that the mu was the requested time that was 14 
And the bar X was the average time that we calculated that's 12. And the standard deviation we calculated a while ago, it was 1.63, right? Good. So now what this works out to be is two over 1.63. So two, divided by 1.63 equals 1.22. Good. Now, 1.22 now is taken to the normal table. So you go to the normal table. and look for the Z value of 1.33. Go to the Z, to the normal table. So I'm going to bring up a normal table on my phone. So you go to the, you search up a normal table, normal table. So you pick up your normal table. My normal tables, yeah. And you look for 1.22. So you look down 1.2 under this Z. One point two, you go across one point two, point two two, point eight eight eight, which roughly is point eight nine. So that will give you zero point eight 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 seven seven. Good. So what's the probability that you will finish the project within 14 days? It's 0.88877. Or there's a 87% chance that you will complete the project within 14 days. All right. So again, when you're given a part distribution, of the times, you're most likely to be asked for probabilities that the project can be completed within a certain time. Of course, these are the bare bones of the project management. Now, sometimes you're asked for something that is called a Gantt chart. So we have looked at when you have done a network under the critical path method. We have looked at when you have done a network under the PERT and the additional question of the the additional question of the probability of completing the project at a particular time. Sometimes you are asked about a Gantt chart. So I expect that what you will do is to review that. You can look that up on your own or when you come to your tutorial, that you will um, ask for the questions about the gun chart. Now, there are times also when you'll be asked about simple questions about um, other little things 
but you will when you get your tutorial you can sort out what those other little things look like so these are the major principles that you will need to practice and to look at and to try to apply on your own and to ask questions when you come to your tutorial so i have 11 sheets here Oh, I think I might have accidentally put it in the... One, two, three, four. Well, I hope you can find them. All the whiteboards, I hope you can find the whiteboards, all right? So I'm trying to get back to the beginning, but I don't think I even want to try this right now. Because I don't want to mistakenly um, undo anything because I think I might have done something. Aha. All right. So, but you would have seen everything from start. So these are the major principles again. So um, I hope this was pretty helpful for you. And um, I will see you at class. So this is the end of the lecture for today. All right, I expect you will take any questions to your tutorial. All right, you will attempt the questions and you will take any questions to your tutorial. All right, bye-bye.